CNCF uh, certified and um, they work on both AWS, GCP, um, and they're a great, great mob to work for. Um, yeah. Um, so the big question, Windows on Kubernetes, why? Um, so that's a question that I asked uh, when we first started this journey uh, at the client that I was working out, and um, a few things come up. So uh, we we all use applications that run on, on Windows, uh, even though we don't like to. Uh, a lot of us uh, do it uh, with hate, but we, we do it anyway. Um, and uh, I, I know that uh, Windows or Microsoft have made leaps and bounds in, in the world of uh, Linux and .NET Core and running a lot of their stuff in Linux, con in, in Linux containers now. But unfortunately, not every application out there that runs on Windows can do that. So there is that stopgap there too. And um, the other thing is uh, there are some features on Windows, as we all know, that just can't be replicated in the um, Linux environment. Um, the other, the other, bit, the other thing is that um, you get a, you know, a bit of a less uh, management overhead compared to running a bunch of VMs and having to uh, run, run VMs and, and maintain VMs. Even though that there's uh, beautiful applications out there like Terraform that can spin up VMs, destroy VMs, and do all that kind of fancy stuff for you, but still, it's a bit less um, management overhead. Um, and of course. Uh, all the benefits of Kubernetes. I'm not going to go through that, um, but uh, there are so many benefits in using Kubernetes. Um, some of them are scaling, auto healing. So things like that uh, are super um, beneficial to, to using uh, Kubernetes. And as we can see, everyone starts using Kubernetes and, and the whole world's going, going to Kubernetes. So everyone wants to be on it, including Windows. Um, so, Windows within a cluster. So it, it's not much different to a normal um, Linux cluster. It still works exactly the same. Um, we still have a, a managed control plane. If you're using a managed service, if not, then you know self-managed control plane um, with all your various. Uh, um, applications running on them, controllers, schedulers, API servers, and uh, etcd. Uh, the other thing is uh, you still need to run Linux node pools uh, to, and, and the managed control plane or a self-managed control plane is still running on Linux. So those two components, unfortunately, uh, won't go away. And we need to run uh, Linux node pools uh, purely because we have some applications running on them like kubedns and a few other things that um, that just can't run on Windows. So a Linux node pool is still needed uh, for some of those applications to run. Um, and then all we have is a Windows Server node pool um, that, uh, that can be joined to that uh, managed control plane. Um, so the minimum version for, for running uh, uh, Windows, uh, this is from a production perspective. Um, it could have been out earlier in a, in a beta phase, but from a production perspective, uh, 1.14 uh, is the is the, the minimum uh, minimum version. Um, Calico and Flannel are both supported. Uh, also, Windows 2019 is the minimum version that you can run on uh, Windows servers, uh, on the Windows server node pools. And the other key point to running Windows within a cluster is that uh, pods and nodes have to be on the same version of Windows. You can't have a Windows, you know, server 2019 running and then spin up a, a Windows 2022 uh, pod. It's, it's not possible. It, it simply just doesn't work. Uh, so a bit of a limitation there. Um, but apart from that, you would uh, expect a Windows node to run exactly the same as a Linux node. Um, there isn't much difference. Uh, so it's pretty, well, 
it's not easy to set up, but it's pretty straightforward. Uh, all the concepts are the same. There's no real differences um, when it comes to that. There's, there's minor differences, uh, firewall rules. Uh, for example, uh, we, we don't have um, the same firewall rules on Windows versus Linux, and there's some other, other differences. But um, if you use the managed service uh, like GKE or EKS, most of that stuff is abstracted away from you and you don't really need to really worry about it. Um, another thing to note is there's two types of Windows containers that you can use. Um, so there's more of a traditional, let's say, Windows container, which is like based on the Linux side of, uh, like the Linux side of things. Um, and then there's a hyper V containers. Um, so when you use a, a Windows container, it's the same thing. You've got a, um, a host, OS kernel, um, and then you've got your containers on top, um, and, and those uh, containers uh, use the same libraries and binaries underneath um, underneath the un underneath to the uh, Windows OS kernel. Um, so, looking at Hyper V, Hyper V is uh, a lot better because it's a lot more isolated, and Hyper V VM you spin up. Uh, a container and it's pretty much you've got a uh, OS kernel there single for that container um, and it's same for the uh, binaries and libraries um, you've you've got it all there isolated from each container um, that's a big benefit uh, for uh, for using containers because uh, if anyone's come across uh, the security world within Kubernetes, they always ask, how do we isolate these things? How do we make sure, you know, there's no container escape, even though it's near impossible? Um, how do we make sure um, everything's isolated and processes can't, you know, talk to other processes, so on and so on? So using Hyper-V can have a huge advantage when it comes to security. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of managed services, EKS, uh, uh, G GC, uh, sorry, GKE, that are just don't support uh, Hyper-V containers yet. Um, so unfortunately, uh, I haven't had much experience with them. I would like to use them, but unfortunately I have not. <clears throat> so GCP's uh, Windows nodes for GKE. Um, so why a managed cluster? Um, it, it's pretty simple. A managed cluster is 10 times easier to use than something that you've managed. Um, spinning up Linux nodes is difficult. Spinning up uh, a control plane is difficult. Managing all that is difficult. Um, try adding a bit of Windows in there and, and you're looking at even more difficulty and, and you're getting to the point where do you really want to have to manage all that? I, I prefer not to, um, so I wouldn't do it. Um, I would personally suggest everyone out there, whoever decides that Windows on Kubernetes is the go for me, use a managed service, much easier. Um, the other thing is, uh, so when we when we create a, a, a managed uh, GKE, uh, all we do is just spin up a normal um, cluster. So go to the console or fry a code, spin up a, a GKE cluster with a one minimum um, Linux node pool. Uh, with a one node, it has to have at least one node. Um, and then from there, you can add your Windows node. So once the Linux node has uh, spun up, then the Windows node can be added. Um, and then away you go, you can start deploying Windows containers. Um, sorry, my notes haven't come up. And uh, <laughs> what does Windows GKE support? Uh, it's in my notes, but I can't see them. Um, that's all right. Um, I'll just wing it. So uh, Windows GKE uh, supports uh, workload identity. Um, so that allows you to use uh, GKE's, uh, GCP's uh, service accounts um, and go back in and access various services from GKE. Um, for example, uh, storage buckets or anything like that. Um, or um, what's another service that we regularly use uh, cloud functions or something 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 similar um, so that that's all supported um, 
they have this concept, and I can't remember what the name of it is because I can't see my notes, but it was uh, MC something or other. Um, but it supports uh, joining the Windows nodes to uh, Active Directory. Um, so if you want to domain join your Windows nodes, it's possible in uh, GKE. Um, so there's that. Um, and I can't remember what else was in my notes, but that's all right. Um, if it comes to me, I'll just uh, bring it up later. Um, all right, so building Windows containers, it can be a bit tedious uh, because when you want to build a Windows container, it's not like uh, in the Linux world where you can run a Windows machine and build Linux containers. You have to build Windows containers on a Windows machine. Um, so if you've got a Mac or you're a Mac person or a Linux person, you then need to spin up a VM within your Mac or within um, your Linux machine and then de um, build those uh, images within a Windows machine. Um, but it's pretty much uh, identical to um, what uh, you would expect to a Docker image to be. Um, I don't know if this is too small. If it is, someone yell out and I can, oh, maybe I'll just increase it just to be on the safe side so looking at a docker um looking at a docker i don't know what that's there looking at a docker file um it's pretty much um identical uh except for uh it's all windows based um so you still got your your image file um from uh and your runs and so on the only difference is we've got uh, start process and add Windows features and stuff like that. So if you're a Windows guy, you'll know what all these these bits and pieces are. Um, ignore <laughs> ignore all these uh, uh, registry key edits. That's embarrassing. I do a lot of that in Windows, but hey, let's not bring that up. Um, We're all friends here. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's disabling certain things there, yeah, uh, ciphers and keys and so on. But, uh, yeah, so you can even run um, run PS scripts uh, to to um, PowerShell scripts uh, to do various tasks and so on on your Docker um, container um, when it's building. So uh, this is the actual build um, and it's, it's, it's so this runs from a uh, PowerShell's uh, command line and this is actually a um, just building the actual image um, and it's still the same command you still do the build um, exactly the same as, as anywhere else in Linux land so same push command so there's no real differences um, it's just uh, we're using a specific uh, windows uh i suppose commands and uh yeah processes and so on so um apart from that it's pretty straightforward um sorry simon yes uh the, one of the attendees is asking if you can zoom in zoom in uh, because they can't see the script or something so if you can maybe like is that zoom better in a bit. um maybe Zoom in more. <laughs> Sorry, I've got um, a very large screen. I thought it was only me that's the old guy here. I couldn't read it. <laughs> I've got a 32 inch monitor. It's, it's essentially a TV. Is it better I now? Your, I wonder where you got your tropical okay. suntan from. That looks good. Okay, yep, they're saying that it's much better now. Yeah, so. Like I was saying, your same same base image. Like I'll, I'll, I'm using a, a Microsoft uh, image, ASP.NET. Um, still the from command. I'm trying to run a few things here by adding some uh, Windows features. You can you can copy files over, um, run some you know certain things. Like uh, we want to run um, certain programs to install. Um, remove some things so i mean everything's everything's pretty much similar from these registry edit edits uh 
can't do that in Linux, but uh, everything's pretty similar. Um, you just got to remember what is the Windows command um, to do these things. All right. Um, so moving on. Um, so deploying to a cluster. Um, deploying to a cluster uh, is no different. And that's that's the big benefit when when we're, we're using Windows containers. Um, we still use the same uh, deployment mechanism. Um, you still use if you want, you can deploy a single container or on a deployment. And the uh, the YAML is identical. The only difference is that you'll have a label that will be added to the uh, YAML, which specifies a label uh, that you need to run on Windows. And the other thing is the image is a um, is a uh, is a Windows image. Um, apart from that, um, there isn't much difference. The only other things you can't do are PSPs, but they're deprecated now, so who cares? Um, PSPs, a lot of the a lot of the PSP um, stuff within PSPs um, do not work on Windows because it's it's all Linux specific um, controls. Uh, so it won't work. Um, and running in uh, a pod running in the cluster is pretty much identical to a Linux uh, pod running in a cluster. Um, it's it spawns exactly the same. Um, I will say that uh, images tend to be a lot bigger within um, within the Windows world. So you get uh, some issues when you pull the image. It can take quite a long time to pull an image from Artifactory or from wh whichever source that you use. Um, best um, tip I can give you is make sure you run Artifactory close to that uh, close to that cluster. Um, if you're running in GCP or um, AWS, try and run your Artifactory or your, or your Artifact um, archive within the same same network. So then you can pull images faster. Um, if you were, for example, running a Windows uh, a Windows uh, cluster and you had to, you know, in GCP and you had to go back to an on-prem artifactory, I don't know if that would be a feasible thing. Um, as pulling images can be quite uh, can take quite a long time. So images tend to be roughly what I found about three. Um, gigabytes, that's probably the smallest I've been able to get it down to. You can get them down to a lot smaller, um, somewhere around the 600 meg. But to be honest, it's a container with nothing in it and nothing installed on it. It's bare bones. And to be honest, you wouldn't be able to use it. So as soon as you start installing, adding features and turning things on, it, it starts to blow it up and um, gets quite, quite bigger. So. The other, the other thing to note when running in a cluster is um, Windows images take a bit of longer to start than a Linux image, um, especially um, the bigger applications. Um, somewhere around the five-minute mark, I've, I've seen some. Um, I haven't seen anything lower than five minutes, um, maybe due to our application that we're running um, as it's a monolith. Uh, but um, in saying that, I, I would like to see someone get get below five um, to start up a Windows container. Um, execing into containers, it's identical to um, the Linux world, except for instead of dash dash bash, you've got dash dash PowerShell, um, and it's all PowerShell commands. Um, so if you know your PowerShell, you're good to go. Um, Troubleshooting can be somewhat difficult. Uh, there isn't that much on the net yet. Um, there is bits and pieces here and there. It's getting bigger and bigger, but um, you're kind of on your own a bit. Um, the community isn't that big. So um, logs are your best friend. Um, and what I tend to do when troubleshooting anything wrong within Windows is try and find the Windows error and troubleshoot the Windows error. If it's a if it's a Kubernetes error, it's pretty, I mean, from my expertise, it's pretty easy to troubleshoot. Um, but if it's a Windows error um, mixed in with Kubernetes, try and just find the Windows error um, that, you're, that you're having and, and try and troubleshoot that. Um, so limitations in building Windows containers. So 
one thing to note is you do not have uh, access to the underlying Windows OS. There just isn't any access um, allowed and they don't give you access to the underlying OS. Um, so even if you wanted um, something like a, um, a Dynatrace uh, to run on your machine, Dynatrace usually hooks into the underlying OS um, and, and you give it root access and um, away it goes and it can go and grab the processes running within um, the Linux uh, OS and, and start giving you a whole bunch of metrics and, and monitoring. Um, within uh, Windows uh, land, you can't do that. There is no root access. There's administrator access within the pod, but there is no root access. Um, this doesn't mean you can't still do the container escape. You still can do that. Um, so don't get tricked. Um, it doesn't mean it's it's safe. Um, uh, so you've got to be careful when you're trying to run, uh, I suppose, daemon sets, for example, like Twistlock or uh, Dynatrace monitoring. Monitoring and, and security tools, I suppose, are mainly the ones that, that get caught up on this. You have to run them on the nodes. Um, so versioning issues, you, you've, every time you update that node, you've got to update your pod. Um, so you, there is no backwards compatibility within um, pods and uh, nodes. So if you upgrade your node, you have to upgrade your pod. Um, it's a bit of a pain, but that's what it is. Um, the Windows OS is needed. Uh, <laughs> so that that is... A, I suppose a uh, big limitation in my my opinion um, having to run a windows machine um, to be able to build containers is is really a pain in the ass um, especially when uh, you get given a mac when you turn up to work um, it's painful because you have to have a vm um, and you can't just use it um, so the smallest usable image and i don't say these ma macro images where you you got 600 meg they're unusable um i'm talking about usable images here around 2.11 gigabytes is what i found um and then you add all your other junk and then it blows out um yeah so that that that's a bit of a limitation pulling uh pushing uh before nbn came along um I made regular trips to my local uh, Wi-Fi tower, uh, not Wi-Fi tower, sorry, mobile tower, so that I could use my phone to upload um, upload images uh, because uh, it, I couldn't do it uh, from my shitty uh, internet uh, provider with the, the uh, bandwidth that I had. Um, so. I've already talked about a few of these, but we'll go over them again. So benefits, I think there's some big benefits and, you know, running all your workloads in one cluster is a big benefit. Um, it and that enables you to um, have all the same security controls, all the same monitoring, alerting, all within the one cluster. You can um, do your troubleshooting on the one cluster, the one spot. Um, so, I mean, from a, from a management perspective, point of view, it's it's a big benefit. Um, the other benefit is obviously that, like I said before, the benefit of Kubernetes is huge. Um, it works quite well with Windows. Um, so it's a massive benefit when you can roll out um, deployments um, and so on. It, it's it's huge. It's one of the biggest benefits, I think, for running Windows on, on Kubernetes. Um, one control plane, like I said, management overhead, um, and the same deployment pipeline. So when you're deploying to Windows, um, you can have the same deployment to Windows and Linux at the same time. Um, we've got a chart that we created uh, that deploys both Windows and Linux containers. Um, so it's just a simple Helm chart. Uh, maybe not so simple, but it's still a Helm chart. You can deploy... Um, all at once and you don't have to do, you know, I've got to deploy to my Windows fleet and then I have to deploy to my Linux fleet. Um, so it's all the same deployment pipeline and, and not much changes when it comes to deployment apart from the, the building of uh, images. Uh, but the deployment of uh, manifests is, is pretty much the same. Um, and then OS agnostic. So you can run both Linux and Windows um, on, on the same cluster. 
uh, which is which can be a benefit if if you think about it. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Not many people run both, I suppose. Uh, is it okay just to, to ask a very quick question? Yeah, sure. So this is um, this is sort of Leif has asked a question, and it was exactly the same one that that um, I was going to ask, and it's just basically how does debugging these Windows boxes sort of you know differ? Are we like have we got a multi-layered RDP? My brain's going to explode tunnel. Yeah, so it, it's not well. So I'll be honest, I've never done a self-managed cluster, and I wouldn't do it. <laughs> I just wouldn't. Um, but from a GCP perspective, it runs on a VM. That VM is the node. That node then has, um, you can access it by RDP um, and, and you can go in and, and interrogate it if you want. Um, uh, it all logs to Stackdriver when you enable it. You can still get console logs within the VM to look at the startup scripts and make sure everything's starting up and, and getting configured correctly. Um, so I wouldn't say it's much different to what um, a Linux node would be. Um, it's not that crazy. Um, once again, you've got to be a Windows person. You've got to understand Windows and how to how to use Windows servers. Um, but that would be the same for a Windows person using Linux servers. Um, they might fumble around, but they'll work it out eventually. So yeah, in my experience, it's it's not too difficult troubleshooting the actual node. Okay, awesome. Thank you for that. Sorry for interrupting. Um, that's um, right. Can I can I just add a follow up to that, Simon? Yeah. So, troubleshooting nodes you spoke about. What about troubleshooting the containers themselves? Is it as easy as troubleshooting the Linux containers? Yeah, definitely. So, um, once again, um, the troubleshooting of of Windows containers is is somewhat identical. There's a few gotchas. Um, you can still jump on them, look at the logs of whatever you want. Um, within the container, you can do whatever you want. It's, it's pretty much the same as Linux. You can run stuff on it. You can um, do diagnostics and so on. Um, one of the gotchas is that uh, when you log uh, Windows containers, it's not done by default. So there's no uh, nice, let's just pump everything to stand it out. You actually have to set that up within a Windows container. Um, this is a limitation, I suppose. It's a good. It's a good point to make on this slide. Um, you actually have to go and set it up. So you have to go and grab your logs, and you have to pump them through some sort of aggregator and pump them out to wherever you need to pump them out to. Um, it doesn't work automatically, unfortunately. You mentioned that that was one of the things that you know that is a little bit tricky. Um, I have to ask the question. I'm going to pass straight back to you. What what have you learned that will definitely break doing Windows on Kubernetes? There's got to be some things that you've done. Newbie alert here. What will definitely stuff it up? Uh, I don't know, to be honest. Um, CIS, CIS there, control. Was, <laughs> there was so many things that it, it was it was difficult um, to remember the one thing that stood out, I suppose. Um, there's lots of little things that you just get caught up. Um, just little things like uh, when you start building Windows containers, I suppose. Um, all, all the different, you go from Linux to, to Windows, I suppose, and your brain's got to convert what you used to do on Linux to, to Windows. If you, if you come from a Windows world and you're just doing Windows and you've never touched Linux before, you might be all right because you might know a lot more of the Windows side of things. Um, I mean, I did a lot of Windows uh, a long time ago, and then I came back into the Linux world um, and then just stayed with Linux. And then this last project that I was on, I went into the Windows world and just getting your head, I suppose, around that I'm not on Linux, I'm on Windows. I've got to convert everything that I used to know from Linux to Windows. I suppose that's the biggest um, gotcha. Um, and that's what got me probably the most mistakes is hey, I want to do this particular thing. I know how I used to do it on Linux. I'm going to try and do it on, on Windows. And I suppose it was just this trial and error process that I, I got through um, that uh, it was just painful. Awesome. Thanks, Simon. Cool. Makes sense. Uh, sorry, last one, and then I'll let you go continue. <laughs> so there's, there's a question from Jason, which I think many people will be thinking about, is... Um, 
uh, where did it go? Yeah, does it need some form of Windows licensing for the containers? So if you if you're if you're not on the containers on the nodes, definitely. Um, if you are running this self-managed, then yeah, you would need to go and, and work out the licensing uh, for for the uh, the nodes. But running the Windows containers, uh, no. But I, I'm not 100 percent sure because, like I said, I've run it as a managed cluster, and we you, you wear the cost within GCP or, or AWS. You would wear the cost. So it's just like running a, a VM within GCP. You spin up a, a Windows VM, that license is included, so you don't have to worry about it. But um, running a self-managed cluster, definitely, you'd have to work out licensing. Cool. Thank you. I'll let you continue. Okay. So back to the limitations. Uh, so at the moment, there's no, no Windows-only clusters. So people that just want to run Windows applications on a cluster, it's not possible. You, you're going to have to have some knowledge on... Um, on Linux, so you need that kind of cross-platform knowledge. Uh, so you're going to have to be able to to run Linux and Windows, and you're going to have to have to know both. Um, so it, it can be, um, I suppose, difficult to start off with, um, depending on which side you come from. Uh, Kubernetes is uh, complicated, as everyone knows, uh, and and running on Linux is is as self-managed is is quite complicated too. Uh, chuck in Windows and, and you'll realize how complicated it can get. It can get super complicated, super quick. Um, and troubleshooting, like I said, it's there's not much out in the world. Um, it hasn't been around for that long. So troubleshooting is limited from a Google uh, perspective. So it can be hard. Um, so it takes me to the next point, which is uh, limited support and troubleshooting. There isn't that much support out there from the community. Um, it's getting there. Um, it's not there yet. I wouldn't say you could just Google and, and find your error at the top of the uh, at the Google list. Um, it's it's just not there yet. So hopefully in the years to come it might be, um, but it's not. Um, so the other thing is eBPF is kicking off and it's going huge and everyone's moving over to Cilium and you know. Everyone's celebrating this. Uh, unfortunately, don't celebrate too early if you want to run Windows. It's not supported just yet. eBPF is actually getting um, added to, to Windows. Um, it's in progress. It's just not there yet. Um, but uh, then once it is, uh, there is support for eBPF, uh, then Cilium would have to go and add it to their, to their product too. Um, so another one is uh, Istio. If you're a fanboy of Istio, it's not running on Windows just yet. So there's been some huge progression there. Um, Envoy, you can run Envoy on Windows, but um, Istio hasn't come along and, and um, added Windows support just yet. Uh, I don't know how far that is away. I haven't really been keeping up to date. Um, to be honest, I'm not a Istio fanboy, and um, it doesn't interest me on running it on Windows. Uh, so I've got a, uh, a, a link here for a full list of limitations. There's quite a big list of what you can't do within um, Windows. There's a lot of technical um, things that you can't do uh, memory-wise, CPU-wise, certain things here and there. Um, I'll let you guys go through that yourself at a, at a different time. Um, otherwise, we'll be here quite a bit of time. Um, I've just gone through the, the probably the, the biggest limitations there. Um, so conclusion, um, you guys should have somewhat of a basic understanding, I suppose, now of uh, Windows on Kubernetes um, and how to, how to build a Windows container. Um, hopefully, you guys will uh, try, maybe, if you feel brave, I suppose. Um, also, um, think about it. Are Windows containers right for you? Um, use your common sense. Uh, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, one of the, the biggest things that, that um, gets me within, I suppose, even the Kubernetes and Linux world is we try and go and grab these applications that are monolithic applications and shove them into Kubernetes. Uh, and Windows side of things, we have some big monoliths. Um, think about it. 
will this monolith work on a Kubernetes cluster? It might work. Is it right for, for the Windows cluster? Probably not. Um, if, if you do see that, just think about it. Have a think and go, well, maybe we should use VMs instead because a monolith doesn't always run that well within Kubernetes, regardless of Linux or, um, or Windows. Um, so yeah, just have a, have, have a think about it when you, I mean, that's, I suppose, both, both sides of the fence there. Have a think about it when you're, when you're porting over applications to Windows. Uh, you can always break them down and, and deploy microservices, like from a .NET perspective, if you've got a big monolith. But I mean, that's time and money, I suppose. So anyway. Um, now, just a quick plug for Enabler. Um, they're hiring. Um, so if you're interested, um, hit up the website. There's uh, enabler.com.au, I think it is. Or is it just .com? I can't remember. Um, probably should have put a link in here anyway. But if you're interested, um, yeah, send us uh, your details in your resume. I suppose uh, question time now. Cool. Thanks for that, Simon. So we do have one question in the question box, which I'll go and ask you. So the question is from CG, and it is, I mean, depends on your experience, but it, uh, the question is compared to GCP, is there any um benefit of using uh, azure aks is there any benefit provided by microsoft um, when you try to host it on windows containers to be honest i don't know i haven't got any experience with azure i mean uh, my experience is quite limited um i've used a, a normal linux cluster on azure but um I, I honestly cannot say um each cloud i suppose has their own offering of a managed um Manage Kubernetes service, um, and each of them are slightly different. Um, each of them might have different um, uh, limitations and benefits. Um, I think if it was Azure, I assume you'd get some sort of discount there on, on Windows licensing and Windows nodes, because it is Windows after all, um, or Microsoft, I should say. Uh, so th that could be a benefit. Um, and they might have their shit probably together a bit more than one of the other providers because, once again, Windows is their bread and butter. But unfortunately, I haven't got a great answer for you. No, sounds good. Um, and another one, I think this is something I've been thinking about. Uh, let's just say if I have to run Windows, um, what do you reckon? Is the Windows support on Kubernetes stable enough from a production perspective? Yeah, definitely. I, I think so. Um, there's features missing, but I mean, features missing doesn't mean it's not um, it's not production ready. Um, so we've got uh, for the client that we're working for, we've got a uh, production cluster. It's running in production, um, and so far, I haven't really come across any huge issues. Um, there's been more development and user issues than Kubernetes Windows issues. Um, so yeah, definitely 100% production ready. Cool. Makes sense. A cheeky one, a cheeky little question. Uh, what about with regards to keeping um, InfoSec happy? As in, you've got Yeah, your... so InfoSec, <laughs> yeah, that, that's a difficult one because uh, Windows comes along and as we all know, Linux, is quite easy to keep in perfect happy when you come along with windows and um you say hey i'm going to run some windows containers they 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 get crazy and they go and you know ask for exactly the same things that you would expect on a windows vm from a windows container um a lot of a lot of the things um can be you know struck off quite easily other things cannot um but yeah, it's a lot, a lot more difficult on Windows from a security perspective than it is from a um, a Windows perspective. And I think one of the biggest ones that I, that I came across and, and they wanted to do was how do we make sure we've got an antivirus running on Windows containers? And I mean that's super difficult. It's super painful. It takes a lot of process. Um, we got a, a way 
a, we, we, the way we got around that was essentially saying, no, the containers are mutable. Um, they get replaced um, quite regularly um, when we deploy. So do we really need, um, you know, an antivirus? Uh, also, you know, you can't jump on onto a Windows container and start installing a bunch of stuff. It, it's similar to uh, the Linux land where everything's being pretty much switched off and, and you can't do a lot of stuff when you're in the console. Um, so if someone did get in, I mean, it, 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 they could probably do something, but yeah, there's levels of difficulty, I suppose. With, with regards to your, your experience, I know that you've not tried every single tool on the planet, but with regards to like the, you know, the twist locks or the, you know, the prisms or the Aquasec tooling, do they struggle? Uh, yeah, they struggle. So the biggest struggle is you can't use a de daemon set. So if you're using one of those tools where you just go and pump it out into one simple um, uh, daemon set, it just go and install on every one of your nodes and that's it uh you, you're finished um you know uh within windows it's not possible because like i said you haven't got access to the underlying os so there's no way to open up that uh, that channel between the container and the os and get all the underlying processes that are running or the underlying access to the, to the libraries it needs or, or or anything like that so Essentially, what you have to do with tools that need that access, that special level of access, is you have to install them on the nodes. And um, it can be quite painful because um, a lot of this stuff um, is is a lot harder when it comes to a Windows machine. You've got to you've got to go through and you've got to look at uh, documentation quite thoroughly and make sure you got everything right. Um, it, it, there's a lot of gotchas when you when you're installing this kind of stuff on the nodes. And to be honest. Installing stuff on the nodes, we shouldn't really be done, uh, but unfortunately, it's just not supported in the Windows land, and that's what it is. So um, we we did mainly everything through. Um, uh, it's essentially a, a startup script that uh, runs uh, on the VM every time a VM is sp spun up. Um, so you like the user data in AWS, um, and and that's pretty much what you got to do. Cool. Or rather, not maybe. <laughs> no, it's not cool. That's that's it. <laughs> hey, anybody else got any got any other questions? We've got some great ones coming in today. So we've got we've got one just come in from uh, from Nick. Um, have you ever encountered any good designs or approaches around developer productivity developing with Windows containers? That's a good question. Possibly not. VS Code, Teleport, to name it, but a few. It, it's all VS Code is pretty much VS Code is unbeatable these days. So, um, and that's what I use. It, it supports a lot of plugins. So I, I would stick with that. Um, uh, but like I said, you need a Windows machine uh, to run these or build these containers, uh, which is painful. Um, but apart from that, um, anything that runs you know, the similar Linux side of things when it comes to containers or on the Windows side of things that runs containers. Um, any build tool that can run the Linux side of things can run pretty much a Windows Windows build too. Um, as long as you can add Windows nodes to it, it's, it's not a big deal. So um, it's, it's not much different, to be honest. Um, it's pretty much like for like, but you're running it on a Windows machine. And I suppose if you're using, uh, if you if you need to have like a chain of trust by signing your Docker images using like the old uh, notary, uh, I, I don't suppose that, that it's going to be any different, is it? No, it's, it's, it's not. It's, it's still the same. Yeah. Okay. That's another way, obviously, of keeping um, Infosec happy if if we can put a paw print on it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's it. 